Jonathan. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Lovely. I, uh, I've been listening to you th today for, I'm 25, about 15 years. Well, when I say I've been listening to your band, I really mean I've uh, been listening to Break Down the Walls and Can't Close My Eyes because I haven't heard... I'm looking at this guy because I haven't heard We're Not In This Alone, Take A Stand, and A Time To Remember. But I own the first two, though. But, um, oh, you gotta get uh, you gotta get the disengage record. You love it. Yeah, I'm gonna try to collect those. I I know I can buy records online, but it's a lot more special to me to go to Amoeba or Love Garden or just a record store and to find it there. That's how I usually buy records. If I absolute uh -huh. for a lot of foreign bands, because I'm married in the Philippines, but for a lot of foreign bands, I'll buy online because it's easiest that way. Because I can't travel to rush into Japan all the time to get records, but. For a lot of my favorite American hardcore bands, I like to buy it in the store because it's just more special that way. Because you know, online, you, especially with condition, you find a record that's like very good condition, and you get it, and it's all scratched up. You know what I mean? It's just yeah, that's true. Better to find it at the store. But so, I've uh, I've read a bit about your band online, about how you started. But I'd like to hear it from you yourself. How did youth today or youth of today become a band originally? Well, I was in a band with the singer. The singer's name is Ray Capo. And when I was in high school, when I was like probably 16 or 17 years old, um, we were in a band together called Violent Children. Violent but Children? Ray didn't, yeah. That's awesome. But Ray didn't, Ray, Ray didn't sing. He played drums. And we really wanted to make it a straight edge band because we were... You know, that's the kind of music that we were really into. We didn't drink and we didn't do drugs. Um, the other guys in the band weren't too into that idea. So we broke up the band with the idea of, we broke up Violent Children. And we wanted to start a new band with the idea that we were going to make it a straight edge band. So that's when we started Youth Today. Oh, wow. I'm a... Uh... I am, I'm, I'm currently not straight edge, but I do agree with the idea of it. I mean, it's definitely a healthy lifestyle, but, so, um, I read on disc, on Discogs that you're, a youth that today is from Connecticut. Well, Ray was originally from Connecticut. I was always from New York. So, but yeah, Ray, Ray was in Connecticut, but once the band started, we moved, uh, we moved to New York. Were you in the same... Were you in the same scene as uh, Urban Waste and all them? Yeah. They were a little bit before us. Uh, um, but I used to go down to CBGB's and I would see bands like you know, Agnostic Fund, The Crime yeah. Mag, and Urban Waste, and The Abuse, and Cause for Alarm, and all those early New York hardcore bands when I was like a really little kid. But they're like a few years before us. Yeah, I know Urban Waste is like 81, 82. Johnny Waste uh, told me yeah. that they're going to do a reunion show with the A7 Club, and I totally wish I could go, but I'm all the way over here in Kansas. That's really hard. <laughs> yeah. Is uh, Utah Today still playing shows? Yeah, we're about, to, uh, we're about to go on tour in Europe in, uh, in November. Oh, wow. Yeah. Are you going to play any shows in Kansas anytime soon? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> oh, damn. How long has it? Have you ever played in Kansas before? Yeah, I think I've played in every single state. Damn, played Hawaii. That's awesome. How many uh, records does Youth of Today have all, all together? Well, our first, you know, there's been a lot of like discographies and things like that and represses, but um, originally we put out can uh, this record as a seven inch called Can't Close My Eyes. Yeah, I've got that one. And then the next record we did was our first. You know, twelve inch full album, and that was break down the walls. I have that one. And then the next record we did was we're not in this alone. I don't have that one. <laughs> and then the last record we did was it doesn't really have a title to it. It's like a black EP with Ray jumping on the cover. People call it the disengage EP because that's yeah. one of the songs on it. I'm and saying that was that our last. That was our last record. So we put out four records, two albums, and two EPs. So, uh, Take a Stand, that's a live album, right? Oh, uh, yeah, and there was a, you know, there's been a bunch of, like, live records and, you know, other kind of bootleg records, but those were, like, the official releases. Wow. Is there any place I can, 
like online that I can buy those. I just a lot of the records of youth of today, as well as many other American hardcore bands, they're insanely expensive because collectors have them, and I I don't I don't feel comfortable spending seventy five dollars on a record, especially when it's not gonna profit the band. Well, why don't you order from Revelation Records, which is a record label? You can go to RevHQ.com, and you can order everything. Lovely, I'll do that. Yeah, I was uh, talking to um, a member of TSOL and a couple other bands, just because I interview musicians, as it's my dream to do that, and um, that's I'm trying to get a lot of these hardcore records I grew up with, because I unfortunately, when I was a kid... I made a lot of cassettes. I got a lot of bootleg cassettes that I made myself of like your music, but I want the official thing, and I just can't get myself to spend seventy five dollars on. I mean, the real thing, but from a person, you know what I mean? Because it's not supporting you. Because I guarantee. Yeah, if, you, uh, if you get it from RevHQ.com, R E V H Q.com. Yeah. I mean, that's a record label, so you know we get paid royalties on it. Um, a question I have since I've this is technically the first time I've ever interviewed a, a straight edge band before, which, like I said, I, I do understand and I agree with your philosophy because it's definitely a healthier choice. But I've read many uh, articles, stories, and I've watched lots of punk rock documentaries. What was it like being straight edge in the hardcore days, and even today for that matter? Uh, well, when we were straight edge, it had been. A few years since all the kind of original straight edge bands broke up, like Minor Threat had broken up, and there was another band from Boston that was a big straight edge band called SSD, and they had broken up. Oh, I, so I know edge, SSD. They're straight edge. Yeah. I did not know that. I knew so, they were uh, hardcore, but I didn't know they were straight edge. Wow. Yeah, they were big time straight edge. Uh, so a lot of those original bands were kind of dead and gone, and so the straight edge scene was almost was practically non-existent. Huh. And people just kind of thought that straight edge was going to be this kind of like interesting footnote in the history of hardcore. But uh, you know, like I said, me and Ray, we were we were straight edge, and we didn't drink, we didn't smoke, and you know, we were. We were into the idea of doing a band and promoting that since the scene at the time was like filled with a lot of drugs. Yeah, of I have a lot read. Of violence. I have read this. So, you know, we were passionate about spreading this kind of like message that, hey, there's an alternative to all that stuff. Yeah, you can be and, hardcore uh, punk and not, uh, not fuck your life up with drugs. Yeah, so it, it caught on. It was really cool. You know a band named uh, Uniform Choice? Yeah, we uh, we played with them a bunch of times. Yeah, they they were one of the first uh, straight edge hardcore punk bands I ever found. I don't know if the are the Gorilla Biscuits straight edge. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I I kind of noticed a trend that a lot of uh, East Coast hardcore are straight edge and a lot of West Coast hardcore are the polar opposite of it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Uniform Choice were like the big straight edge band out there. There's another band called Instead. Um, Chain of Strength were a big straight edge band from the West Coast. There were a few. What um? Were more in New York. What bands uh, did you uh, enjoy the uh, touring with the most? Like, which bands did you collaborate with the most back then and even today? You know, we played a ton with. Uh, Uh, Gorilla Biscuits, you know, a lot of New York hardcore bands like Bold, we played a lot with. Um, uh, i trying to think of who else we toured with. Have you ever played with the Casualties before? No. I know they're rather new. Well, when I say new, I like the last 20 years. I don't actually. I know they're. I know one album by them, Under Attack, but I know they're from New York. Uh, I don't know. They're not from. Yeah, maybe they are from New York. Yeah, we never played with them. Uh, They're more of like a punk band. We're more of a hardcore. You know, band. Yeah, I, I get what you mean there. Have you ever played with the Bad Brains? Uh, we've never played with the Bad Brains, but one of the greatest um, one of the greatest things in Houston Today history was 
we played a show, like a, a big show in New York City with that band Discharge. You ever heard that? Oh, yeah, Discharge. Discharge. Yeah. It was a huge show. And when we played, HR jumped on the stage and he did a stage dive for Youth of Today. <laughs> That's we, were, awesome. we were honored at that. But I've seen the Bad Brains many times, so I never played with them. Oh, damn. Still pretty badass, though. Yeah, uh, cool. I'm trying to think of. Um, are you a, are you a, I've I have a bootleg seven inch that I bought at Amoeba Music over six years ago. It's I mean I think it's a bootleg. Did you ever do a split with Seven Seconds? No. Okay, then that's definitely a bootleg. I, uh, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of bootlegs floating around. That's for sure. Yeah, you, hell, you go to a record store nowadays and you kind of have to pull up. You know Discogs, right? Yeah. Have to pull up Discogs and run the little VIN, not the VIN number. That's for vehicles. You have to run the little the little ID number just to make sure it's legit. But else, sometimes I kind of do like buying bootlegs because sometimes, especially if if they're of a live show that someone recorded, because it's always nice to just have a you know what when a band that does a live album recording, that's one thing. But like when someone else, I just I just love live shows and. I, I really wish I could see your band live at some point. Do you ever plan on uh, touring in maybe Philippines at all? Or playing a show in Manila? Uh, my other band, Judge, just toured Southeast Asia and we played the Philippines. Oh, damn. Yeah. Was, yeah. The show was incredible. Where'd you, uh, what the venue did you play at? Oh, boy, I can't remember. When was it? Um, it, was just, it was just last fall. Oh. So it wasn't that long ago. It was it then maybe Katrina's the B side? Uh I'm not really sure. I, I I can't really remember, but the show was it was literally incredible. Yeah, I'm a, I'm married to a Filipina and I'm a part of the Brave New World. It's a Philippine underground hardcore community, which I have a record label myself and it's based in Manila, but yeah, Filipinos, they love American hardcore. When American punk rock band goes over there, they go fucking wild over that. <laughs> yeah, I believe it. They actually they went, they lost their minds. It was great. Because un unfortunately, a lot of bands don't ever, like, they'll tour in Japan and maybe Hong Kong. But most uh, most punk rock bands skipped over the Philippines, and I kind of wish that would change. I mean, Manila has a super massive underground scene. It's just so overlooked, and... I'm ho the reason I bring it up in this interview is because I'm hoping that other bands who maybe watch this would head up to the Philippines because I love my second country. But um, I'm looking through your list of singles here. Do you guys have any plans of making an, a new album? Um, no, not yet today, but I'm also in that band Judge. You know, uh, another New York hardcore band. And we're going to do another record. I'm also in a band called Shelter. No, we're gonna do a new record too, but probably not use it today. Could you um since I I have heard of Judge and I've I cannot remember remember what the album was called, but can you go into the history of Judge and of uh, Shelter for me, please? Since I don't I definitely don't don't know the other band. Well, Judge happened kind of like at the end of Youth of Today, and we put out two records. We put out we actually put out three records. We had a single that was called um, New York Crew. And then we put out an album that was called Bringing It Down. And then we put out another single that was called uh, There Will Be Quiet After the Storm. I think I heard that we one, actually. I think I, that one sounds familiar. What is a, what does Judges sound like in comparison to Youth of Today? It was way heavier. It was a little like... Um, it was a little more chugga-chugga. We were like one of the... You know, we were like one of the early straight edge bands to kind of play with a little bit of a metal influence. Although it's not really metal, it's more just kind of heavy. Yeah, but it, had a much kind of, it, it had a much kind of like chunkier sound than you today. It was a little bit slower. What's the, uh, when can uh, whoever's listening to this expect the new Judge album to come out this year, next year? Next year. We're working on it now. Is it going to be on the vinyl, cassette? Uh, I'm sure we don't really, it's still kind of too early to tell like what label's going to put it out or, or anything, but um, expect it out sometime in 2020. 
All right, definitely be ready for that. <laughs> and um, the other band you mentioned, Shelter, you said. Yeah. Can you? I have no clue who that is. So can you tell me all you can about them? You never uh, heard of Shelter? No. Shelter was the Hari Krishna hardcore band. The Hari what? Hari Krishna. You ever heard of the Hari Krishna movement? I know. I I know of Krishna because of a Philippine punk band by the name of Woods, but not really. Uh-huh. But enlighten me. Uh-huh. We were, uh, after we did Youth Today and after I, I did Judge, me and the singer did this band called Shelter, Ray Capo again, the singer for Youth Today. And we were I like both, his vocals, by the way, if he hears this. <laughs> um, yeah, we did this band. You know, we both uh, kind of became monks in ashrams and we lived in Krishna temples. In we the were, U.S.? Like, uh, yeah, huh. and we were we were very deeply inspired by um, Eastern spirituality, you know, from India. Wow! And so we started a band called Shelter, which was you know most of the lyrics were based on like the teachings of the Bhagavad Gita and kind of ancient Indian wow. texts. And it was a really cool band. Sounds awesome. I'm gonna look it up after this interview. <laughs> Yeah, we used to tour and stay in temples, and that's awesome. You know, we lived like monks. We would wake up early and we would chant and meditate. And uh, it was an interesting band. It was, it was really cool. We got we actually got really big. We got way bigger than used today. Yeah, I, I like um, I like Ray Capo's vocal expression, like. I'd say he shouts, but it just, the way he carries his vocal ability, and I'm saying this because I hope he hears it, the way he just, when that, like, you know how Ian McKay can just shout? Ray Kappa's got that to his voice. It's, I mean, I'm not going to shout myself because I can't worth the shit, but he's a damn good singer, and I'm, you with the combination of you and him and the rest, it does it perfectly. Oh, cool, thanks. <laughs> of course. Um... Is, a, is Shelter still playing, or is that done? Uh, Shelter is going on to our November also. Hell yeah. Where, you said in Europe, right? Yeah, in Europe. Uh, and we're probably going to play, um, and both you today and Shelter are playing some shows in the, on the East Coast and the West, both the East Coast and the West Coast in November and December also. What, uh, do you know the specific dates in November? Um, if you look on my Instagram, they're all listed. My Instagram is, do you have Instagram? Yeah, I've got Instagram. I'm, I'm, I'm a active user on there. If you look up the, the Hardcore Yogi. <laughs> I like so that. Those three words, The Hardcore Yogi, that's my name on Instagram. I have them posted on there. If you just go back to a, a, you know, a few weeks of posts, you'll see like a... Alrighty. Shelter flyer and a judge flyer and you can lay flyer with, with the with the date with the uh, European dates. We haven't really announced all of the American dates yet. Well, the reason is because uh, November, sometime in November, I'm gonna turn into the Philippines because uh, November 29th, which I hope you look these bands up as I tell them, Urban Bandit and Potroy Ska. I'll send I'll send them to you in a message on Facebook, but they're a uh, legendary Filipino punk rock and ska. Urban band that started in the early eighties and they're having their thirty year reunion show on November twenty ninth. And Putre Ska, they're a nineties ska band, but they're having their second reunion show on the same day. Arnold Morales, which is a good friend of mine, he uh he started Urban well technically before Urban Band he started a band named College, but they didn't really do much, but they they made a big explosion on the scene, but they didn't put anything out other than a five-song demo. But after college, he formed the Urban Bandits, and they put out Independence Day in '85, and then Putre Ska happened in the '90s, and they put out two two cassette tapes. But yeah, they're playing on November 29th, and I'm trying to be in the Philippines by the middle of November so that I can, was I gotta meet my wife in Vietnam, and then we're gonna for a honeymoon, then we're gonna fly to Manila, but. If I can make it to your shows, I will definitely try to... You said East Coast, right? Yeah. I will definitely try to work that in somehow. Because I've never seen Youth of Today, uh, Judge, and Shelter, and 
by by the way you've made them sound. I mean, I know how you the today sounds, but by the way you made the other two sound, I definitely want to see them live and meet you in person if possible. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's, the live show was what you today and all those bands were really about. Yeah, you can, uh, I tell people all the time, which I haven't really seen many, too many live shows. I'm, I wish I could see more, but I live in Kansas. The only two places around where I live where bands play is like Lawrence. Have you heard of Lawrence, Kansas? Uh, yeah. Lawrence and then Kansas City, which I can get to Lawrence pretty easily, but uh, I don't drive. I have a driver's license. I've got a moped, but I can't ever get up to Kansas City. Like, uh. In 2018, the Subhumans, the UK Subhumans, they played at the Riot House, but not too many bands that I know stop by, and it's sad. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, these days we usually just play like the East Coast and the West Coast, quite honestly. That's what most bands do. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where most of the punk rockers are, the East Coast and the West Coast, because when it started, you know, wasn't that like... Pretty much the inception, L.A. and New York for the most part. Yeah, that's true. Um, so, where do you uh, what I, I ask this question quite often? Can you, what's your opinion of the scene today compared to how it was when you first started? Um, it's a lot bigger. You know, nowadays you'll have like a hardcore fest, and there'll be thousands of kids there. Which, you know, back in the day was, you know, if you had a hundred kids come to your show, it would be <laughs> a good show. Um, so it's definitely a lot bigger. You know, whenever it's bigger, you have more problems, too. You have more problems with violence. And yeah, I get you. Things like that. But, uh, you know, I think at its core, it's the same. It's just a bunch of, you know, it's a bunch of kids who are kind of sick of the way society tells them they have to be. And they're looking for for something a little bit different, a little bit more energetic. You know, so as long, whenever there's going to be, like, rebellious, angry kids, it's going to be hardcore, so. What was on your mind when you first started your first band? Like, what bands influenced you to start? Well, quite honestly, the very first, you know, the first band that really that I saw that really kind of inspired me that, hey, I could do this too, was the Ramones. Hell yeah. You know, I saw the Ramones when I was a tiny kid. I mean, I was probably, I was probably 14 or something when I saw the Ramones. What year and was it? Of, uh, what was that? What year was it? Um, it was like early 80s. Oh, nice. Yeah, maybe like 81 or something. I don't know. Something like maybe 1980. Probably 81. Did you uh, get to meet any of them? No, but, um, you know, all the bands that I had been listening to kind of before that, you know, the, the, the level of musicianship was so high that you just thought like, hey, I could never do this. But, you know, the Ramones... They were such a great band, but, you know, they basically just bashed out three chords. <laughs> Hell yeah, they did. But, you know, it just kind of empowered me to think that, hey, if the Ramones can do it, I can do it too. Did you, great. Did you, do you have a solo music career at all? Um, no. Uh, and I know this next question is going to be off the charts, but um, have you heard of Sonic Youth? Yes. Are you a fan? Uh, yes, I have an interesting Sonic Youth story. Let's hear it, if you're willing to share. Well, Thurston Moore's one, my idol. <laughs> well, th you know, Thurston Moore's from the hardcore scene in New York City. He was like a hardcore kid when Youth Today were around. He kind of got out of it, he got out of it pretty early. And I think one of the reasons why he got out of it was he used to do a zine, and he reviewed Break Down the Walls. And he gave it, like, a horrible review. <laughs> and he said some really disparaging things about Ray Capo. Oh, no. And, you know, he was just a little skinny kind of nobody in the scene at the time. You know, this was before he even started Sonic Youth. Oh, and so one time I was in a record store. 
And I, it really kind of pissed me off because he said some like sort of nasty things about Ray. Oh god. You know, I mean, it's one thing if you don't like the record. Okay, you don't like the record. Yeah, he'd be critical of music. Like, you know, to say a bunch of uh, you know not so nice things about the singer was just not called for. Was he making fun but, of him for being straight edge or just? No, it was just I can't remember exactly what he said, but it's just some kind of like mean stuff. <laughs> just about Ray as a person. Jesus, there's and, and so I was in a record store, and I was friends with the owner of the record store, and the record store owner kind of tipped me off. He called me over to the register, and he said, that's the kid that <laughs> gave the break down the walls, a bad review, and said all that stuff about Ray. Oh, shit. And it was, and it was Thurston Moore. <laughs> so he walked, out of the, he walked out of the record store, and then I walked out. Uh-oh. And I went up to him, and I kind of flipped him around and I said, hey, you're the guy that does that zine, right? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, you think you could just get away with saying shit like that about my singer? Uh -oh. I, was like, you're an, I was like, you're an asshole. I should freaking kill you right now and <laughs> kick your ass. I was like. You think you can just go around talking about people like that, saying in print a bunch of nasty stuff and not expect it to come back to you? Oh my god, I wish I could have seen And so I kind of pushed him around a little bit. I didn't beat him up. I never had the intention that I was going to actually beat him up. But I just, just kind of wanted to scare him a little bit, just so he thinks the next time that he yeah. writes an article about somebody and you know says kind of mean, uncalled for stuff. So I pushed him around a little bit. I scared him a little bit. And he practically, he never came to another show. <laughs> so I like to, I like to think that, you know, part of him going off and doing his own kind of music and his own kind of scene was so much, maybe a little bit inspired by the day that I scared him out of hardcore. Because <laughs> oh, then he started playing different music and he started playing oh, youth and they got really big. And... Did he ever tell you why he said it for? No, he was he was he was so scared he couldn't even talk. Yeah, I mean, I I don't I don't know him personally. I've never met the guy, but he definitely did. If uh, if I just randomly read that story on the internet. I wouldn't believe it because Thurston does not seem like that type of person. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know him personally, but holy hell, that's insane. I mean, we were both kids. You know, I was probably 18 and he was probably 17 or something, you know? That's crazy. Like this, this was pretty, like, this was pretty early on. Yeah, yeah, but, you know, I, you know, I have no hard feelings towards him, whatever. Do you right? still talk to him? Stuff. Uh, no, I haven't talked to him since. Uh, well, I mean, if I ever saw him, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't care. I, you know, I did a lot of dumb stuff when I was 17, too, so. Another another band off the blue, uh, the Beastie Boys, did you ever play a show with them what, before, before they went to hip-hop? No, I actually, um, again, they were a little bit before my time, too. Like, they were urban waste, kind of. Yeah. They were, they were actually super early. Like, they were one of the first New York hardcore bands, the Beastie Boys. I think they were the Aboriginals, originally, or something like that. Abor uh, maybe, uh, I'm not sure. I'm saying that so wrong. But, um, yeah, I never, by the time I got into the scene, those guys were already doing their, were doing their hip-hop thing. I remember, like, early on, they put out, you know, they put out that seven inch that I, I really like their seven inch. I mean, when I was Cookie Puss. No, before Cookie Puss, they had a record that was called. Um, God, what was the Beastie Boys record called? So uh, I, I have no, now, I have no now clue. I'm to, now I'm gonna have to Google it because I can't remember. I'm on Wikipedia looking for it. It was the Beastie Boys hardcore record. Um, fuck. Uh, I, I know what, I know, I, I see the image of it in my head. Uh, Polly, Pollywog Stew. Pollywog Stew. Polly yeah, Pollywog Stew. Stew, that's what it is. So I had the Pollywog Stew record, and I loved the Beastie Boys, but they were already broken up by the time I started going to shows. But, hey, you mean transitioned, um, pretty much? Yeah, and then there was this rumor that they started doing hip-hop. 
And I remember I was in a record store one day, and it was the day that Cookie Puss came out. Like that, it was a 12-inch single. And I was like, oh my God, the Beastie Boys. And I was like, I wonder if it's hardcore or if it's hip hop. <laughs> so I bought it and I took it home and you know, it was hip hop and it was actually really good. It was super funny. Yeah, that Cookie Puss is psychedelic hip hop. It's one of the best records I've, one of the best records in that genre that I've ever heard. Yeah, but um, then they got, you know, then when License to Ill came out, they got huge. Oh, they yeah. went on tour, and that New York hardcore band Murphy's Law opened up. And so it was the Beastie Boys, Run DMC, and Murphy's Law. That was the whole tour. And um, Youth of Today was on tour, and we were in California. And the Beastie Boys were playing in California, too. So we're, we were friends with Murphy's Law, so we got on the guest list. <laughs> and, it was, nice. and it was really cool. It was at the LA Auditorium, which is like a, you know a huge th you know amphitheater. And so we got in early because we were on the guest list. And when I walked into the club, um, Run DMC were sound checking. <laughs> and you know I loved Run DMC. Like you know they were like you know one of my favorite you know hip hop bands back then. And one of my favorite Run DMC songs was that song uh, Rock Box. Remember that? Yeah. That song on their first record? Da na 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 And so um, they were sound checking, and BMC said, Yo, Ron, let's do Rockbox. Let's do Rockbox. And so they sound checked with Rockbox, and they didn't even play it live. They played mostly like, I think, the, um, that was kind of like their Walk This Way era. So they played mostly new songs when they played when they played live, but I was so excited that I got to see them play Rockbox at the sound check. Hell yeah, I'd be excited too. Yeah, it was cool. To to bring up another name, do you know the name Lydia Lunch? Uh, yeah, I've heard of Lydia Lunch. I don't really know too much about her, although. She's or the some kind of the no no wave scene from New York. I'm I'm just bringing up a bunch of New York bands because half of the people who I've talked to don't know any of this stuff so it's kind of nice to talk to someone who actually is familiar with that scene because you were in the 80s over there i know you're like early to mid 80s but still you at least know these bands though yeah were you familiar i know with lydia lunch i know i've heard of lydia lunch i probably heard some of her some of her music before but you know i was really into hardcore I wasn't so much into that kind of like art rock scene. Yeah, that's kind of the direction I've kind of headed in my life. I mean, as a teen, you know, uh, Uniform Toys, uh, Youth of Today, Dead Kennedys, Seven Seconds, Exploited, Bad Religion, all the, How Can I Help Be Any Worse is my favorite record by them, TSOL. I'm kind of jumping back and forth east and west coast. I mean, when I'm in the mood for just straight up stripped down hardcore punk with a furious attitude, I go east. When I'm in the mood for what I just said, but more of a shock rock value, I go West Coast because I feel like West Coast bands are more to offend and piss people off. East Coast bands are more for the message. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like a Gnostic Front, they're definitely a more message music. Yeah, for sure. But, um, damn, that's, that's crazy as hell. Do you have any uh, recent stories of uh, being on a tour when something intense happened? Oh man, I got a million stories. Well, if we're at 34 <laughs> minutes, I'll just, uh, yeah, hit me with your best shot. I cannot believe I just said that. Um. Well, let's see. So, you know, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the crazy stuff happened back, you know, back in the day. <laughs> you know, because it was almost like the, the hardcore scene was almost like the Wild West back then. Now it's a little bit more civilized. Um, yeah, I've, I've noticed that. Unless you go to the Philippines, then it's uncivilized again, because there's no yeah. no authority, no rules. I'm trying to think of a good recent story. I, mean, I have a lot of great old stories. You can tell anything you want. Cause, uh, I'm just I'm in I'm very entertained by your by your music life, and I I just want to hear as much as I can. I mean, one story that you know. Toby from H2O. You never heard that band H2O? I think I've heard of them before, yeah. They're great bands. You should look them up. H2O. 
they're a New York hardcore band. Toby lives in L.A. now. Uh, he just sent me a flyer, and it was from an old show that Youth of Today played in Florida, in Miami. And we played with a, a skinhead band called Bad Rep. Bad Rep. <laughs> yeah, they, they were a skinhead band from Miami. And so the place was filled with skinheads. <laughs> I mean, there must have been at least 100 skinheads there. I mean, you know, there's probably like... And that was a big show. I mean, there's probably a thousand kids at the show. And there's probably a hundred of them are skinheads, like big, scary, tattooed skinheads. <laughs> make you nervous so, a little bit? <laughs> what was that? Did it make you nervous a little bit? Uh, they actually liked us because oh, on our first rec on our first record, Ray is on the cover with a shaved head. Oh, and so that's they not... were like, they were like, "You guys are really cool. You guys are sneaker skins. You guys are sneaker skins." Sneaker. We actually all had shaved heads at that at that show, and oh, you know they all wore Doc Martens, but we wore sneakers, so they called us sneaker skins. Ah, <laughs> so they okay. they kind of liked the band. But anyway, this band Bad Rep is playing. And I'm at the balcony, it's like at this old theater, and um, there's just a, like, regular people couldn't even dance because these skinheads kind of took over the pit, and they were just dancing, like, really violently. But there was one kid who looked like he kind of was New Wave or something, like, he looked <laughs> almost like he was from Devo or something, like, he had oh, really shit. thick glasses, and he had a weird kind of Devo, New Wave haircut. And he was dressed sort of weird. I think he had like, I don't know, like a button up shirt on or something. What you the know? fuck? And so you could tell that it was probably like his first show because he really didn't know how to slam. Like he was just kind of like running around the pit. <laughs> and so um, there was this one really big, fat skinhead. Oh, boy. And the kid was kind of bopping around in the pit. And when the kid kind of like, ran into him a little bit, which, oh. whatever, you're in the pit. People are going to run into you, you know? Yeah. This big, fat skinhead took him and he threw him to the ground. Oh, shit. And then he kicked him. Oh, And then man. the song ended. And as soon as the song ended, like, uh, this the fat skinhead guy was going, man, you think you could run into me? Bad rep skins. Like, he's saying all this, like, skinhead stuff. Messing with my crew. You know, just a bunch of stupid stuff. <laughs> And this kid was a, kind of like a little skinny kid. But you never really know who's tough and who's not. Like, this little skinny kid was actually super tough. Oh, boy. And the kid, and the kid got up, and he took off his glasses, and you could tell, like, this kid was ready for a fight. And there's a hundred skinheads, and there's one big fat skinhead, and the kid said what did you say to me? What did you say to me? Oh, boy. And he grabs the skinhead in the headlock, and he drags him to the side door, because it's an alley that's outside the side door. And so I'm in the balcony, I was like, oh my god, oh. this is incredible, this new wave kid is going to fight the skinhead. So I ran down the stairs immediately, and like, pretty much the whole, whole kind of like, blood was pouring out of this alley to see what was going to go on with this fight. And so I got out there pretty early because I was watching and I could see the whole thing happening from the balcony. And so this skinny little new wave kid pulls the guy into the alley and literally all of those hundred skinheads are in the alley. The bad rep skins, the band, come off the stage. They're in the alley. And this kid throws this fat guy down and he beat the crap out of him. Like this kid was like... He must have been a boxer or something like I don't know what he was. He knew some kind of like martial arts or boxing because he lit this guy up <laughs> and beat him black and blue within like one minute. Like the oh guy was just God. a bloody mess on the floor in the alley within one minute. That's awesome. And then he and then he turns to all there's there's a hundred skinheads watching this. You can imagine this. Oh I'm trying friends with this guy. And then he, after he beats the guy up, like, super violently, like, the guy can't even get up, he's all bloody, he turns around and he faces off with a hundred skinheads, and he goes, who's going to be next, motherfucker? Oh, who's my next? God! Which one of you skinhead motherfuckers is, is coming at me next? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, none of you. I thought so. And then he, like, walked back 
into the club, and everybody kind of came back into the club, and not one skin had touched them. I the wouldn't dare. Oh. <laughs> Jesus Christ. It's like one of those great things, you know, like sometimes in a very rare occasion, like justice is served. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I just I just imagined that in my head as you're telling me. I, damn, I wish I could have saw that in person. Holy yeah. hell. That's why I love punk. All right, so, brother, I got I to gotta, I gotta end on that note because I got some place that I got Yeah, yeah, you, you, you gave me 40 minutes and I appreciate every, every second of this. And that story was a perfect way to end this. But you got any last comments about the tour, your band, or anything you want to tell anyone? Uh, if you see us playing, come to the shows. Hell yeah. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, man. Alright, brother. Hey, have a good one. Me too. Bye -bye. That was fucking awesome!